Hi, everyone. Um, I'd like to start off actually by thanking Dean Feinstein uh, for his dedication to student involvement and for letting us introduce this panel to you today. Um, my name is Emily Rieg. I am a junior at IU studying political science and Near Eastern languages and culture. Um, I'm from the Woodlands, Texas. Uh, I am an Arabic flagship student and the one of the co-founders and the president of AMO Outreach for Displaced Peoples, a student organization on campus. Um, I started AMO Outreach with the goal of facilitating cross-cultural communication between students and refugees. Um, so we do different events. We teach uh, English to um, refugees at a center in Louisville, Kentucky online. Um, and we also host a variety of uh, educational and outreach events about refugees on campus. Um, we actually have one event tomorrow, Seeking Refuge. It's an interactive event navigating the migrant crisis. Um, so we would love to extend an invitation to all of you. It's tomorrow from five to seven upstairs in the atrium. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Tanya to introduce herself um, and our moderator today. Hi everyone, my name is Tanya Ramos. I'm from Jasper, Indiana. I'm also studying international studies. Uh, and I'm going to introduce uh, the moderator today. Uh, we are very lucky to have Dan Balls as the moderator for this important dis session. Balls is the chief correspondent at the Washington Post. He joined the Post in 1978 and has been involved in political coverage as a reporter and editor throughout his career. He is the author of four books and has won a number of awards for his reporting. He is a regular panelist on PBS's Washington Week and is a frequent guest on the Sunday morning talk shows and other public affairs programs. Please join us in welcoming Dan Balls. Uh, thank you very much, Emily and Tanya. Thank you for kicking this off. Um, I want to say how pleased I am to be here. Um, uh, it's a wonderful campus, and this is a great conference. Uh, so I feel a privilege to be part of it. I want to extend thanks to Lee Weinstein for uh, doing so much of the arranging and coordinating, obviously, to Congressman Hamilton uh, and Senator Lugar for the role that they play here and that they've played in Washington for so many years. Um, and uh, we have a big topic uh, to talk about today. And um, this has been described as the worst uh, refugee crisis since World War II. Uh, we will talk about the dimensions of that, but there are an estimated uh, 65 million displaced people in the world, according to the UN Refugee Agency, including 22 and a half million refugees. Um, I think all of us have seen the videos and the photos and read the stories of, of the desperate struggle of people who are, have, have been displaced and are seeking a home elsewhere or seeking something elsewhere. Um, we've seen what the flood of refugees has done uh, to countries in Western Europe, particularly Germany, but throughout Western Europe in, in uh, roiling the politics. We have seen the implications uh, of what has happened here uh, in this country uh, in this current time. I think we know two things about the United States uh, in this broader context. One is that we have historically both welcomed immigrants and refugees and at times recoiled from accepting people from other nations. Um, and secondly, we know what a controversial issue this has become in our current politics. Um, we're in a broad transformation in this country. Um, by 2044 or 2045, we'll be a minority majority country. Um, perhaps as a result of that, we're consumed uh, by a debate about national identity, about who should enter the country, under what circumstances, who should be forced to leave, how aggressively we should go about that, uh, and how secure we can all be uh, in a time of international terrorism and threats around the world. Um, in the last panel, uh, my old uh, colleague and good friend Mike Abramowitz noted that the failure of many Western democracies to establish, I guess what you could call rational and successful immigration policies and the, uh, and the degree to which those failures have contributed to the current climate, um, the United States in, included. I, I want to say one other thing before I do introductions, and that is we ought to keep in mind how perceptions do change about these issues. Um, we may look today on counties in this part of the country in the Midwest uh, as quite homogenous, uh, basically all white counties, and yet if you go back 100 years or more, 
those were counties in which there were, and areas in which there were great tensions and ethnic divisions among Italians, Germans, Swedes, Irish, Poles, and others, uh, only to undergo an eventual assimilation. So uh, whatever the current context is, this is an evolving issue, and we will, we will be a different country 10 years from now and 20 years from now and, and beyond. Uh, so the question for today is what's new, what's not? Um, how do we navigate through these issues? And fortunately, we have four terrific people uh, to talk about that. And let me first do some introductions, and then I will kick it off with some questions. Um, to my immediate left is Eric Schwartz. Uh, he is currently serving as president of Refugees International the non-governmental organization that advocates on behalf of refugees and displaced persons. From 2011 to 2017, he was the dean at the Hubert Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. He's still associated with the university. Prior to that, he served at, as a U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Population, Refugees, and Migration in the Obama administration. Earlier postings include Connect U.S. Fund, a multi-foundation NGO collaborative seeking to promote responsible U.S. engagement overseas. Um, to his left is Assad al-Salah. Uh, he's assistant professor of Arabic literature and comparative literature and cultural studies in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures here at Indiana University. Uh, his research examines personal narratives in Arabic literature, particularly modern Palestinian autobiography dealing with issues related to identity and displacement. Uh, his interest in these narratives uh, demonstrating the intersection of Arabic literature and political culture resulted in the publication of his book a couple of years ago called Voices of the Arab Spring, Personal Stories from Arab Revolutions. He's currently researching narratives of ISIS that inform their ideology. Um, next to him is Rebecca uh, Erbelding. She is uh, currently historian at the, uh, at the Holocaust Museum. Um, she has been at the Holocaust Museum since 2003. She is currently serving as an archivist and curator overseeing uh, a, a, the upcoming exhibition at the Holocaust Museum called Americans and the Holocaust, which will open next month. Um, her first book, it's called Rescue Board, The Untold Story of America's Efforts to Save the Jews of Europe, will be published what, April 10th, am I right about yeah. that? Um, so uh, look for that. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the New Yorker, and on the History Channel and National Geographic. She earned her PhD in history uh, from George Washington University. Um, and at the end of the, the road uh, here is uh, Ron uh, Vitello. Uh, he became the acting, acting deputy commissioner of the US Customs and Border Protection in April of 17. Since early 2017, he has been chief of the U.S. Border Patrol. Uh, as its chief operating officer, he's responsible for daily operations of the Border Patrol, and he assists in the planning and directing nationwide enforcement and administrative operations. He entered duty um, with the Border Patrol in 1985, first assigned down in Laredo, Texas, where I spent a little time when I was in our Texas Bureau about 30 years ago, um, watching the comings and goings across the border. Uh, he served in a variety of other places in Texas, Arizona, and elsewhere. Um, and during his postings at headquarters, he was instrumental in the unification of the, uh, the CBP and the creation of the Department of Homeland Security. So uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I, I said, Eric, I wanted to start with him because of the position he holds. Um, and, and simply to, to ask you to give us an overview of the situation today. What are, what are we looking at both not, well, not just in terms of numbers, but uh, the, the, the size, the scope, and particularly how does this compare with what we have seen in the past? Uh, thanks, Dan. And you also asked me to address uh, U.S. Uh, perspectives all in five minutes. Um, but, and I'm, I'm going to take- <laughs> Five 40, and a half, go ahead. Okay, well, I'm going to take my first 30 seconds just to thank uh, uh, Lee Feinstein, um, uh, the Dean of, uh, of, of the School of Global and International Studies. I hope I got the name right. Um, um, you are very lucky to have uh, uh, an individual of such distinction as your dean here. And, um, and I'm delighted to see the success of this wonderful institution. I'm also very grateful to be in an institution that is uh, the two, with which um, two heroes of American foreign policy, um, uh, Lee Hamilton and Richard Lugar, are associated. Um, 30 years ago, one of my first jobs was on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, 
working for Congressman Steve Solos, but we all worked for Congressman Lee Hamilton. Um, <laughs> so, um, and then finally, I'll be watching, if I can, the IU women uh, play in the NIT semifinals tonight. Um, um, you, they impacted the Minnesota women when they beat them at the end of the season, and, and, but they, Minnesota still got into the, into the, uh, into the tournament. Um, so, having said that, um, yeah, the world is, is, is a very, very dangerous and chaotic place right now in so many respects. Uh, the numbers you've heard, uh, more than 65 million um, uh, individuals who are uh, uh, displaced as a result of persecution and conflict, you can add to that uh, 25 million a year displaced by disasters borne by natural hazards. Um, in addition, uh, slow onset disasters, climate change, result in effectively the forced mi mi migration of many more. These numbers are the highest um, in recorded um, history. Um, and they are, um, in, in the, and governments of the world are increasingly uh, recognizing that while we all have to deal with the root causes, the causes of refugee flight, um, that's not gonna stop the reality that we have huge numbers of displaced persons. And the other 40 million or more, because Dan mentioned that uh, there were 22 and a half million refugees, are people who are in refugee-like situations, but they're within the, the borders of their own country, living often in hellish uh, circumstances. There's also an increasing realization and appreciation that the large majority of these populations are protracted populations who have not, who, the, the conventional notion that refugees leave and then come back after certain, to, the, to their countries of origin or resettled, that's really not true. We have very large numbers of protracted situations um, and, um, and that increases um, you know, the, the significant and substantial nature of these challenges. Um, and um, so how do we deal with it? And, uh, and, and, and how is the world coming to grips with it? And, and, and part of the challenge is the fact that um, as, as imperfect as was the post-Cold War system, if you will, of international governance, um, it, you know, much of that system is, has been breaking down as power has shifted from west to east globally. And that, that, that has been accentuated, unfortunately, from my perspective, uh, by the advent of you know, an administration. You know, there has always been, in the United States, bipartisan support for refugee assistance and pr protection, whether that's the administration of George W. Bush, um, which um, uh, adopted the good humanitarian donorship principles and was responsible for the highest increase in um, Iraqi resettlement in our nation's history. We were resettling 18,000 Iraqis every year, uh, whether it was um, the, the, the uh, administration of Ronald Reagan, who said a hungry child uh, knows no politics. Um, we, we have seen a, a fundamental change in January, and that has impacted uh, the situation in the world. Um, and um, the, uh, uh, you know, dramatically, and, um, and, and it's reflected in requests for dramatic, for dramatic cuts in foreign aid. Um, it's, uh, it's, it, it's reflected in the absence of American leadership on international humanitarian crises that we would have assumed in the past the Americans would be um, uh, you know, right in front. One of the greatest crimes of our generation, the forced um, relocation of more than 650,000 uh, Rohingya refugees from Burma to Bangladesh. How many of you? How many of you have read about it? How many of you know about it? And uh, and I, I'm, I'm sure many of you do in this community. But there's an example of a, of a of a situation that in the past the United States of America, no matter what administration, would have rallied an international effort to really address that issue in sig significant and substantial ways, and that isn't happening now. Um, and on the domestic side, we also have the same kinds of challenges. I'm looking at my time, so I'm not going to go into them. But with respect to a refugee suspension, a suspension of refugee resettlement uh, that created enormous pain and suffering. And while continual renewal and, and reform of refugee screening processes of those who come into the United States is essential, I was responsible for much of that in government. It, 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 was not, it, it did not justify the kind of ban and the kind of clogging of the process we now see. And so these are, these are significant and substantial challenges. But I, I want to end um, with, a, with a hopeful note, um, and because I, I see my time is quickly running out. Um, Don't worry too much about okay. that Okay, all right. Then I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll take another two minutes, if you thought. will. Um, we all have to appreciate that 
Um, the consensus in the United States throughout our history on behalf of the principles of diversity and inclusion has always been a very fragile consensus. In the early part of the 20th century, Father James Coughlin uh, you know, was, on the, was, was on the radio with anti-Semitic rants um, and, nation, you know, and, 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 and appeals to the, to the really sort of the, the, the worst kind of restrictionism. And he had tens of millions of followers. Um, Joseph McCarthy had tens of millions of followers. In the, in, in, in the 19th century, the Know Nothing Party, which was railing against um, um, immigration from certain European parts of the world, had very, very broad following. So our consensus on behalf of diversity and inclusion has always been a fragile one. And it's always depended on leadership, on political leadership. And that's the difference. T to my mind, that's the fundamental difference that we're now uh, experiencing. And to my mind, that's a hopeful sign. Because that suggests to me that what we're experiencing is not so much a historical transformation, um, but a political challenge, and a challenge that you know, groups, you know, and many groups around the world, uh, around the country, and around the world are, are trying to address. The U.S. Congress, for example, in many respects, is trying to address it when it, re when it rejects 30% cuts in U.S. humanitarian assistance programs and appropriates, as it did a week or two ago, increases in international humanitarian assistance. And um, governments of the world, and I'll finish right after this, uh, governments of the world are also pushing against it in many respects when they're looking at, at solutions for refugee, uh, for protracted refugee situations in places like Uganda, in Turkey, in Jordan, where they're, where they're recognizing that refugees aren't going home and they have to provide these communities with work opportunities, with opportunities for education. So it's not, it's, the, the picture to my mind is not completely bleak. And, and, and I think, um, you know, and so I think it's, it's incumbent on, on fair-minded people who care about these issues to continue to be engaged and, and continue to articulate principles that really, you know, are, are at the heart of what it means to be an American. Thank you, Eric. Assad, I want to turn to you. I mean, you did the book Voices of the Arab Spring, which was about a moment in time in which there was clear hope for greater openness and democratic governance um, in the Middle East. Um, that moment turned out to be fleeting, and, and we've seen since then the terrible uh, Syrian civil war and what that has done to, to displace so many people. Uh, I'd, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. One is um, put a human face on this issue. I mean, from the, from the conversations you've had and the study you've had and the knowledge you have in your own personal experience, uh, give us a better sense of the people who, who, cre who make up this, this crisis. But also, um, if you could, give us a sense of how uh, people there and people who are displaced and refugees look at or toward the United States and how they see them today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, First, to the effect of how we can, uh, can look at refugees. I think, after all, they are human beings. They have the same sentiments, the same intellectual thoughts, the same uh, pursuit of happiness and liberty. They are looking for better lives, better than the ones that they have uh, suffering from maybe their entire lives under dictatorial regimes in the Middle East. Um, in 2016, spring 2016, I was given a fellowship by a think tank in DC. So I went there for a few months. The first month was very hard for me because I was looking for housing in DC. <laughs> and people would ask me the first time I go and meet someone for potential housing, they would say, so where are you from? And I would say, from Indiana. They said, no, no. Where are you from? <laughs> You're really from. I was like, OK, uh, I'm from Syria. At that time, I was not naturalized. So obviously, I don't look like the typical American. So I said, mm, OK. And uh, I don't know if they feel like empathy or whatever. But uh, before they kind of conceptualize who am I, they would say, what do you do here? 
I say, well, I'm an assistant professor at Indiana University. I was like, ah, okay. So you are not just like the typical refugee that we have in mind. You can be assistant professor at a recognized university in the state. And I never tried to correct them that I am not a refugee. I was like, why not? Let them think that I am refugee, not that I am trying to get a better deal on housing. <laughs> just to make them think high <laughs> of refugees, Syrian refugees. Because I think they are human beings like us. They can uh, be knocking at your door looking for uh, housing or maybe looking for some other source of help from you as someone who is capable provider. And that's nothing wrong with it. Uh, the Convention for Refugees by the UN was actually established in 1951 merely for European refugees. All the like international law mechanism that is meant for recognizing refugees and providing help for them was uh, initially for a different refugee that we have in mind, the European refugee. And now, unfortunately, we have another wave of refugees. They happen to come from the Middle East. Unfortunately, again, with all the deeply rooted racism, uh, maybe Islamophobia, the perception of these refugees is problematic now. And uh, I met a lot of them in Germany where they were appreciative of the opportunities given by the German government. They are providing them with, sorry, with housing. Uh, the government there is giving them uh, the opportunity to look for a place and the, the, the government will pay for it. They are looking, uh, they are also providing them with language training and also they are giving them a salary of about uh, 400 euros per month per person in the household. Very generous, but at the same time, this is where you can see, none of them I met uh, forget to mention how thankful they are for the German government for what they have done to them. Many of them emphasize the fact that they have never seen this generosity even in their Arab countries. So these are human beings who interact with the way you treat them. If you treat them generously, they will be very thankful, very gracious. At the same time, if people are hearing negative attitudes, and that's the last thing that I need to mention, uh, of uh, our leader here, now I am American citizen, so I can have something to say about the leadership in this country. When they hear all the negative attitudes coming from the head of the state in, in this country, they also are reacting very badly. And when I went to Germany, they say, oh, you come from America. How come Ronald Trump, Donald Trump is saying this about refugees, about Muslims? I said, you know, he's not German even though, unfortunately, when you look up his <laughs> autobiography, you find that he was originally <laughs> German. <laughs> so uh, one last thing, recognition. Uh, Hegel, the, philosopher, the German philosopher, talked about uh, recognition in a very interesting metaphorical manner. I don't have, to, uh, I don't have time to uh, delve into it, but eventually all people are looking for recognition. Even the populists, I mean, yes, the refugees are human beings. We have to uh, appreciate their human nature. But at the same time, I think even those who have anti-refugee sentiments, they are also human beings who are like us. They have these conceptions that we need to engage with them. We need to tell them that maybe better of having those perceptions, go and engage with refugees, talk to them. That will give you the opportunity to change your negative perceptions about them. And also refugees, they are trying their best to inter, inter, uh, integrate in the societies. They are trying to understand how people think about them, what people are expecting from them. And I think there is a huge gap between refugees and the societies hosting them because there is no emphasis on the, inner, uh, the uh, human integration, making people have these comfort uh, contact zones where they understand each other and try to understand what, are, what is the idea of a refugee, why they are there, uh, 
and what are they looking for in, in their host countries. Good, thank you very much. Uh, Becky, I, I mentioned that you've, you've got this book coming out, um, Rescue Board, uh, which will be out next month. Um, you wrote in the book uh, the following, the United States in the 1930s was rife with racism and anti-Semitism and suffering the devastating effects of the Great Depression. Americans warily looked across the ocean at the worsening international situation and grew concerned about national security. Similar economic and security concerns, valid or not, have echoed through the decades in the face of, the most, refu of most refugee crises since the Holocaust. It, Give us put, us, put this in a historical context. What are we dealing with today, and how does that compare with what you've been studying in terms of the historical waves of refugee crises, and particularly the one that the book is about? So, I mean, I think the challenges and, and the rhetoric that people use when they talk about refugees today is very similar to the challenges and rhetoric that people faced in the 1930s. So, in the 1930s, Eric already mentioned Coughlin, um, you know, there were quota laws regarding how many Jews could go into universities. There were clubs where Jews were not allowed. Um, so anti-Semitism and xenophobia was a huge factor at the time. Um, one of the eugenic societies uh, actually had annual conferences in the 1930s. And in the 1936 conference, they debated whether they should protest the Emma Lazarus poem on the Statue of Liberty, whether that should be removed because you know, did the French know it was there? We are not a nation that should welcome people anymore. Um, there's hearings in Congress where people make the claim that the United States is and has, has historically been an exclusionary country, not a country um, that, that has this idea that we are a place where everyone can be welcome. So that is not a, un that idea is not universally acknowledged. It has never been universally acknowledged throughout American history. Um, in terms of economic concerns, you know, in the 1930s, the Great Depression was, was going on throughout the 1930s. In 1939, um, the United States was suffering 19% unemployment. Um, and the World War was beginning. And so all of these concerns and challenges really addressed or really um, affected the way that, that the United States looked at the refugee crisis that kicked off really with the German annexation of Austria in March of 1938, um, when you know within a year, over 300,000 people were on the list, the waiting lists to get into the United States. I should back up for a second and say one of the, the key differences between now and then is that in the 1930s, the United States had no refugee policy. Uh, we do not have a refugee policy to speak of really um, until I would say 1980 almost. Um, after the war, there is a recognition that refugees can, uh, consist of a specific group that should be separate from immigrants, but the 1951 Refugee Convention, the United Nations Convention, um, was not signed by the United States. The United States did not sign it until the refugee protocol uh, expanded the definition of refugees to relate to refugee crises from anywhere in the world. So the 1951 one was about refugees who became displaced prior to 1951 in the European continent. After 1967, it was expanded worldwide. There was an international recognition that refugee crises were not going to end and that we needed to expand these protections. The United States finally signs that with very little fanfare in 1968. It gets almost no news coverage. Um, and really, it's not until 1980 that the U.S. has a, a policy of how we will fulfill that mandate that we have agreed to. Um, prior to that, there are piecemeal laws um, and executive orders that deal with specific refugee crises that are in contained periods of time and contained refugee populations. So Hungarians escaping the 1956 revolution, Cubans escaping from um, around in the 1960s. Um, Indo-Chinese who are displaced by the Vietnam War. It's really not until 1980 that we, that we have this idea of a yearly group of refugees that are, that are able to come to the United States. And so prior to um, the Holocaust, you are in the same line as, as people who are leaving or trying to come to this country um, under ordinary circumstances. And the U.S. puts in place no laws to assist these, these refugees who are fleeing persecution 
um, to make it any bureaucratically easier for them to get out and get into the United States. So by 1939, after Kristallnacht, um, after the Kristallnacht attacks, there are over 300,000 German born who are trying to get into the United States um, and a very small percentage of them actually make it before the war. Um, but in terms of the United States, the, those challenges have remained throughout. I think they were particularly acute in the 1930s um, because of the depression, because of the, uh, the approaching war, because of this fear of xenophob this xenophobia that came um, in part because of this massive wave of immigration at the turn of the century had kind of manifested um, by the 1930s in xenophobia and racism. Um, so it is particularly acute in the 1930s and, and we can see had very real results at the time. And so it, it stands to, to the future as to whether um, these same forces will have the same results now. Great, thank you. Um, uh, Chief Fatello, I want to uh, turn to you now. Um, you, you are not dealing directly with refugee issues, um, but you are in the middle of this national debate about immigration and refugees. Um, you have responsibility for the border of the United States. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, first of all, if you could just tell us at this point, what is the state of movement across the border. What, I mean, we, we hear so much about how porous the border is, how unprotected it is, and yet we know that there have been changes in the flow uh, of, of immigrants, illegal immigrants, coming across the border. Could you tell us sort of what the situation is at this point and kind of how you're dealing with all of these issues in the middle of a very charged national debate and, and, and moment? Great, thanks, Dan. I just want to echo my thanks for the university, the panel, and an opportunity for us to share uh, our experiences here today. Um, just sort of by way of background, um, my mother is a displaced person from 1946. Uh, they fled the Soviet takeover of Lithuania, and she, com she came over in uh, 1946 with her, her family of four as a young child. So I have a, a background that understands that scenario and, and what, it mean, what it meant to Europe at the time and kind of where, where we're at today. Um, as it relates to the border, CBP uh, was created out of recommendations of the 9-11 Commission in 2003. It's the first attempt in the government to unify all border-related activity, including enforcement. Uh, the Border Patrol became part of CBP. Previous to that, the INS was in the Department of Justice. Um, lots of activity in the early 80s when I started. There were, I was part of a, uh, a growth spurt in, in the early 80s to get better control because the public dialogue was about the southwest border, um, the, the increasing difficulty with drug importation across the southern border. Uh, so a lot of focus on, you know, cocaine coming out of the Caribbean, um, flows, illicit flows through Mexico, including illegal immigration. Um, and I've seen it change over time. The most dramatic change uh, after 9-11 when CBP was created, uh, we saw uh, a lot of growth in the organization and the capability that we have across within you know, the enforcement regime uh, inside of the Border Patrol. As an example, um, from 2003 to 2010, uh, we effectively doubled the size of the Border Patrol, the people who are on the front lines in between ports of entry protecting that border. Um, we've seen, uh, starting in January last year, 2017, we saw a dramatic decrease in the number of people who are trying to attempt illegal entry. I think we went in May to like a 45 year low in illicit flows across the border, marked by the number of arrests that we make each and every day throughout that year. Um, what we saw in the previous years and what we're seeing now is an increase in people who are fleeing the Northern Triangle, uh, Guatemala, El Salvador, uh, and Honduras. Uh, those folks are coming into the country in larger numbers starting in May. Uh, as, we, as we sit here today, it is the largest single increase of population um, across the southwest border. So the numbers are coming back up. Uh, I think the economy is driving also a, a, a flow from Mexico as well. Um, we're seeing better economic conditions, so there's more opportunity for people in the United States. What's happening with, these, with the flow from the Northern Triangle, um, the way the laws are constructed and certain policies and, and uh, and lawsuits that the government works within. Uh, if you come as a family 
as a member of a family from the Northern Triangle, or if you come as an unaccompanied minor, we all saw the, the radical increase in numbers in 2014 when the, the system and government was overwhelmed by the number of people who were coming. And that situation under the law still exists. And so if you come as a family unit or as an unaccompanied minor, essentially you're taken into custody by Border Patrol or CBP at the ports uh, and you're processed for removal, uh, an opportunity to have a removal hearing. Uh, and then these people come into the states and they're, the, the system for children are, are immediately turned over to Health and Human Services, they're put in shelters, and then they're placed with family in the United States uh, so that they can have their due process. Um, and then the families, uh, for, for the same kinds of reasons, the, the, uh, the system for enforcement doesn't allow the government to hold these people until the opportunity for them to have their hearing. So essentially, they're, they're released into the states, um, and so they are encouraging others to, to come and make that journey. Uh, I will tell you that it's a, it's, a, it's a terrible experience for a lot of them coming through uh, Mexico on the way to the border. They're, they're abused by smugglers and, and criminal gangs taken into custody. It, it, is a, it is a harrowing experience for some. And so because of those loopholes in the law, they're allowed to be released. That's the, the, the sort of discussion that was going on about immigration reform and you know, what we were asking for. And, and then obviously this is all on top of you know, the administration's desire for us to get more capability on the border, uh, to do better as, as it relates to the public's demand for a more secure border. So all of that in context, we're in a, we're in a period in, in CBP and in the department where um, this latest budget allows us to grow and add capability on the border. Um, I think in my own experience since 1985, when we are more competent and capable at that border, when we can assure the American public that the, the level of security is sufficient, um, then it allows the broader society and then government structures to be more generous in, as it relates to who's allowed in, how quickly, and, and what the numbers are as far as you know, processing and bringing people into the country. CBP's role as it relates to refugees is to essentially welcome them to the United States, right? With, we work very closely with the State Department, with uh, the UN Commission to understand who's coming and when they come, and then verify their identity as they, as they come into the states. And then you know, that's the role that CBP has in the, uh, in the refugee cycle. Could I ask you a couple of uh, quick follow-up questions? Um, one is when you, when you talk about the de decline that you began to see in January of 2017, to what extent was that a function of the kind of the rhetoric that the president engaged in during the campaign and as he, as he took office? Or to what extent was it due to other issues that may have been already existing uh, that you, we just began to see you know, a greater sense of that? And the second, obviously, is this question of a border wall. Um, and you know, that's obviously terribly controversial, and yet you all are in the middle of that. Um, how do you weigh in pro-con or, or try to stay out of that piece of the debate about what immigration policy should look like? So we, our role at CVP, my role as a government, you know, a career employee is to execute on whatever the legal uh, construct is, right? We're, as it relates to the wall, um, the president's team came to CVP, people like us, and said, hey, how do you do this? What is the best way to accomplish this? We want to meet the demand in the public for a secure border, and, and the wall is a component of that. And so what we did is we packaged up what our capability needs are with a structure on the southwest border. So we prioritized where we thought it would be most effective, um, and then we educated the department and others about it can't just be the structure. In and of itself, a border barrier doesn't do anything. Uh, in combination with additional agents, access to the border, and then a suite of technology that allows us to monitor that space. That's where we come out as career employees and say, you know, the secretary came to the commissioner and myself and said, hey, how do you do this? And we put that plan together and prioritized where we want to go with it. Um, as it relates to the, the decline in, in activity from January and then through May, um, it has been my professional judgment and experience. What I've seen over a career's time is when people think there will be a consequence to them crossing the border illegally, they will come in fewer numbers. And so I think people made a calculation in January of last year, or maybe before. Um, because you think about when, you know, people, if, you're, if you lived in, you know, a small town in, in Honduras, you're going to sell all the things you have, 
provide those funds to a smuggler to get you from your hometown to the southwest border. And so they made a calculation based on the rhetoric, based on the discussion about the demand for a secure border, and they did, elected not to take those steps. But over time, through May and coming this way, uh, we've seen people, that, that calculation has now changed. Yeah. And so that's, that's, in my experience, it's very hard to measure why you know, the flows go up and down. Uh, the economy has, has a, uh, an impact. I can tell you that uh, consequences to the activity um, make a difference. And the enforcement. Uh, we, there's a couple of studies out there. Pew did a couple of things. Uh, uh, the Center for um, International Studies did a few things. About half of the calculation that people make, 50% of the decision making, is based on what enforcement consequences look like. Yeah. Eric, you want to jump in? Yeah, just a, uh, and, uh, you know, in this area, um, there are interests and there are obligations. And I'm going to talk about the obligation side, um, which I think is connected to the interest side, but I don't want to run over my time uh, again. Um, and it is true. There, there's no, you, everyone has to appreciate it. I'm a veteran of the Haitian boat crisis. I was in the White House when we tried to uh, manage that issue in 1994, the Cuban boat crisis. And there's no question that perceptions on the part of people who are coming impact their decisions about coming. That's why, on, on one level, you could say in Europe, that the effort to, to, to address and manage migration from Libya has been successful if you define success as, as people no longer coming over. If that's your definition of success, then it's successful. But the costs you know, for European governments have been to be complicit with the government of Libya in the return of people to just you know, outrageously awful conditions you know, in Libya. So there's no question that if you, if you articulate a strong deterrent and you put measures in that send a very strong signal that you're going to be you know, treated pretty, you know, pre not only pursuant to the law, but pretty harshly, people will stop coming. Our concern and my concern, I was in Central America in, uh, and our team was in Mexico and Central America uh, a couple of months ago. We, we, put, we, we issued a report called, uh, entitled Putting Lives at Risk. I mean, our concern in terms of the US side of this is that there are practices that don't, you know, that principally don't come at the local level, but from the federal level, from the Washington, that really don't meet our obligations. So if you say to an asylum seeker, we're gonna prosecute you. Um, if you come in and you've entered illegally and, um, and you make a claim for asylum, you say, I had to cross the border illegally, but I'm making a claim for asylum. And we say as the US government, okay, but we're gonna prosecute you, we're gonna convict you, we're going to put you in prison, and then after your sentence is over, you can apply for asylum, or which is what we do. And or if you say that um, we're going to, um, you know, if you come to the border and you make out a credible claim that you need protection, despite prior guidance that says people who have those credible claims for protection, you know, will be able to be at, um, released until their asylum claim is determined. In your case, what we're going to do is we're going to put you in prison until your asylum claim. Or if there are credible reports of US officials you know, you know, telling asylum seekers that they don't have the option of, of, of applying for asylum, you know, all of those measures will succeed in terms of deterring people. You will have less people come over. So we, if those of us in this business, we have to accept the fact that if you can't manage migration and protect refugees at the, same, at the same time, you're not gonna be able to protect refugees, right? Because you, there won't be a societal consensus in favor of that. But there are lines beyond which we shouldn't walk in terms of our obligations. And, and so that's the concern of my organization, uh, is that, that some of the measures that are being imposed at the policy level, just, you know, they will be successful if you define success as stopping people from coming over, but they go too far. Um, I wanna ask, uh Asad and Becky, this question, or these, these questions. Asad, let me start with you on this. Um, the, the president, one of the things the president has said is it, it is better for us to deal with these refugees where they are and figure out a solution there rather than saying we ought to do more to bring more of them into the, the United States. Um, how valid is that? Is that, a, is that a valid position for the United States of America to take, or, or, or is, there, is that a flawed argument? 
no, this is a valid position. However, the president said so many things that he didn't fulfill. Maybe he didn't mean them. But it's absolutely more practical to deal with the issue of refugees, at least in Syria and Iraq, uh, taking into consideration the source of it, where they come from and how you can deal with it. And uh, nobody is actually doing any measures to address that. Uh, I think uh, in 2000, by late 2013, uh, there was this red line drawn by uh, President uh, Barack Obama saying that uh, the regime in Syria shouldn't use chemical weapons, but they did use it. And the red line was crossed, but the punishment was just to take the chemical, the, rem the reminders of the chemical weapons and destroy them. Uh, nothing was done to address the fact that you have a totalitarian, authoritarian regime uh, leading a lot of people to flee the country, or if they are targeting certain areas in Syria, make them internally displaced. Nobody was talking about how to address that issue until now. There was a position that I was up for uh, that uh, they should at least... Uh, diminish the capabilities of the regime to launch airstrikes against certain areas. If, tho if those airstrikes were stopped, then people will be safe on the ground. They wouldn't flee because the airstrikes are the most effective, uh, punitive measure the Russians now and the Syrian regime more effectively in the past used to let a lot of people evacuate their towns, including mine. Uh, my town is now totally empty due to the Russian and the Syrian regime airstrikes. And they do it uh, straightforwardly. They kill few people, destroy few houses, and then everyone will flee. Well, now they are internally displaced. But imagine if that w didn't happen, then they will have at least the ca capability of staying. Uh, the, uh, the president uh, suggested that we will have a no-fly zone. And that was a very plausible solution to limit the regime's capability of launching airstrikes against certain areas in Syria, the restive areas in Syria. But again, he didn't do anything about it. I wish that would be fulfilled, but it's not. And I agree, this is a very uh, effective measure had it been done. Uh, a lot of people are fleeing because they cannot cover themselves from a rocket coming from the sky. Becky, um, um, it could easily be argued that the, that the president has, if not full public opinion on his side on these issues, that, that there is a lot of public opinion on his side. Mm -hmm. um, and for all the reasons that we've talked about, um, as you have looked at the ebb and flow of this, what changes public opinion? What, what does it take to, to change public opinion at a moment when it's, in a sense, hostile to bringing more people in, to making the country more welcoming? Um, that is difficult because, it, you know, historically it has usually been a 60, 70 percent um, of Americans consistently do not want more immigration into this country, and it, it doesn't really change. Um, you know, after World War II in December 1945, after people had seen the liberation of concentration camps, had visual evidence that the Holocaust had happened, Americans are polled about whether they would allow more European immigrants to enter the U.S. than they had before the war, and 5% of Americans are willing to accept more immigrants than before. Um, five. And so it, it doesn't really change, and I think um, organizations like Eric's and, and like others are, are working towards this idea of trying to humanize refugees and trying to change the tenor of, of public opinion, but it has been a slow and long um, slog. Um, in the 1930s, organizations are trying to do that too. There's, there's a movement um, during the refugee crisis in the 30s to move refugees away from, and I use refugees even though it had no legal sense to mean European Jews who are fleeing persecution and landing in the US. Um, move them away from cities and into the Midwest um, to get them jobs to places where there were jobs and to allow, 
Americans in the middle of the country and on the Western coast to see who these people are um, as a way to humanize them to have co these conversations. There's a refugee hostel in West Branch, Iowa um, that brings 200 uh, German and Austrian refugees in and they take classes in the town. They go and learn about American weights and measures and um, go to schools and talk to the students. Um, and so it's this big movement to try to bring these sides together and change public opinion in that way. Um, the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee publishes a brochure, not under its name, but under the name of a Quaker organization, figuring Americans might not trust the Jews, but they, they'll trust the Quakers. <laughs> who, who opposes Quakers? Um, so, so about how refugees are economically, refugees and immigrants are economic boons to the societies that they land in and, and that they um, create jobs instead of take away jobs. Mm -hmm. um, we know now that those are not arguments that stick. Uh, those, those arguments keep coming up again and again. And so the jury's out to some extent. I, I wanna ask Eric one question and then I wanna turn to the audience to have you question the panelists. Um, and as we do that, when you are, when I call on you, wait for the microphone, say who you are, and then pose your question, and please make sure it ends with a question mark. Um, Eric, um, back to the, the refugee policy at this point. Um, um, if you were, if you could wave a magic wand, and, and knowing everything you know about the degree to which so much of this is controversial, uh, and in the sense that the conflicting feelings that people have on almost no matter what side they're on on this issue, right. um, what's a rational policy right now? Um, well, before articulating a rational policy, I think, um, can I have three minutes for this one? Okay, uh, I think I need to articulate um, the, we, we have to start with the substance. I think the, the narrative issue is critically important and we're struggling with that issue. And as I said, it's, well, the consensus here has always been a fragile one. So it makes it very difficult for a non-governmental organization, you know, when, when the loudest voice in this discussion by far is at the very top, is, is, a, you know, is, the, is the President of the United States. But I think you have to start with the substance, right? Why is this important? And I would say there are four reasons. First is, U.S. When you think about refugee policy, it's not only refugee admissions; it's also overseas humanitarian assistance. And the United States has traditionally provided a quarter to a third of that assistance around the world. That leadership, that leadership, has been, um, you know, has has distinguished us. Our, our willingness to exercise leadership has distinguished us, us from every other government in the world. Um, for us, it wasn't transactional. It was, it was really, it was, it was, it was um, you know, international good citizenship has its rewards in terms of alliances, in terms of, you know, governments willing to do things for you without asking because of their perception of you, of, you, of the United States of America, as a big benign power in the world in large respects, not exclusively. I don't want to be, you know, for those of you who come from a different ideological perspective, I, I, I'm not looking at this with rosy-eyed glasses, but U.S. leadership, smart power, gives us enormous benefits. Two, to second of four is the instrumental needs in terms of generous policies of, for immigration and refugees. I was the dean of the University of Minnesota where we produced a, a rigorous study which said that if Minnesota did not expand dramatically its um, inclusion of immigrants and refugees over the next 10 years, the economy would suffer dramatically. And I would, I would venture to guess that the same kind of study could be done right here in Indiana. Um, third, the myth of the danger. You know, since 2001, there has not been one case of a resettled refugee, of the nearly million who've been resettled, of a, one case of a resettled refugee responsible for an act of terror that led to the loss of an American life. And that simple fact, you know, is in such contrast to the rhetoric that we hear on this issue. And then finally, why do we need to resettle? Why do we need to resettle 100,000 refugees a year when there are 65 million? Because when we demonstrate to the rest of the world that we have a stake, right, that we have skin in the game, it makes it much easier for us to cavalierly say to the government of Jordan, the government of Turkey, yeah, you've got a few million refugees, we want you to continue to treat them well so they don't end up leaving or you know, coming, you know, or creating more, more challenges. 
We want you to treat them well. We want you to give them uh, education, employment. You know, how, can we, how can we say that if we're not prepared you know, to, to resettle? So I think I've some number of refugees. So I think I've described the components of a policy. Continued international, generous international support, uh, um, greater effort to exercise leadership based on humanitarian principles, on humanitarian issues. We don't make judgments about who, um, whether we're going to support people in need based on the political predilections of their leaders. That's not the judgment on humanitarian assistance. It might be on other forms of assistance, but not on humanitarian assistance. So we exercise that leadership. And we have a, a, a robust refugee resettlement program. I'm talking about resettling a million people a year, but by all means, we could have done 110,000 a year to demonstrate to governments around the world that we have skin in the game. So that's my policy. Good. Thank you. Questions? Microphones? There you go. Hi, my name is Madison O'Day. I'm a junior here. I study asymmetrical security and Arabic. And my question actually has to do with Arabic. Um, one thing that I've noticed about American education is that Americans are kind of on the whole very linguistically and culturally insular. A lot of Americans don't speak a second language. Um, but in my personal friend group here at IU, my friends speak Turkish, Farsi, Spanish, Chinese, Arabic. And all of them tend to be very empathic towards the refugee crisis and, and migration in general. So I guess maybe this is a question for the whole panel. Um, do you think that there's a role that early linguistic and cultural education can play in making Americans more open to the concept of like refugee um, displacement in the United States or, or migration in general? Saad, do you want to take that on? That's a very brilliant question coming from a brilliant student of mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm yeah. sorry, I didn't realize this was I, an inside game. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I hope my answer will be as brilliant, but I'm not sure about that. <laughs> the definitely uh, learning languages will kind of integrate you as a citizen with the uh, different culture. So it's, it works like opposite of the uh, perception that we need to integrate the refugees into our language, into our culture. If we are willingly uh, open up to learning another language, then they w we will learn more about the cultures of those languages. Then when they, uh, w we will be more excited about refugees. If you are learning uh, Arabic, then you will like, oh my God, I need to meet those refugees. I want to maybe practice my language with them. I will tell them how much I know about their culture, about where they come from. I know where Syria is, where Iraq is. I know how to say marhaba, salamu alaikum, hi, all these things. So this is a very high level intellectual integration. I would say humanitarian integration, intellectual integration, where we recognize as human beings that we don't have one tongue, we don't have one color, we are ready to open up to other human manifestations. The humankind is very complex, it's very interesting, so it's actually showing a very great uh, human citizenship to be open up even before we have this so-called crisis of refugees. Other question? Yes, sir, on the aisle. My name is Kalam Shaban from Bloomington Refugee Committee. We deal with the refugees. Is it working? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I, am, I would like to challenge Dr. Al Saleh about his issue that we, it's better to serve the refugees in their own place. Mm -hmm. Tell me, how can you help the refugees in Aleppo that was destroyed completely, or Mosul with two million population that was destroyed completely, and many, many other cities Maybe in your district of that area, it was beneficial to get ISIS out or the refugees or bring them back. But when they have a political destruction, an economic destruction, and this is the story that's going in South Sudan, in Burma, in Congolese, in Central America, where the refugee has no access to go back, mm -hmm. it's the only solution in this case is to help for that refugee to come and settle somewhere else 
where it is safe, where they can start their own life. And, and second question is, we haven't touched, Professor Schwartz mentioned that, what the contribution of the refugees who settle to the economy and the culture after a year or two or more. And this issue in Germany when they accepted more, over a million simply because they need a working force that is educated, that can build a German industry in the future. So thank you. Okay, uh, I would always love people to challenge our ideas. This is how we can maybe nurse better critical thinking about our positions. Maybe we keep them open for modifications or changes. Uh, my position is to address the idea of allowing dictatorial regimes to create more refugees. I am talking specifically about the Syrian situation where by allowing uh, Bashar Assad to keep fighting this ruthless war against his own civilians, yes, there are some terrorists in the uh, back lines or the front lines, but the majority, 80% of the casualties are civilians. And therefore, those who don't die, they have to flee. And by giving him this kind of uh, uh, allowance to do whatever he wants is in, in itself very problematic and that will definitely lead to more refugees. So take the example of Aleppo. We could have said to Bashar al-Assad, hey, we might find a solution instead of destroying half of Aleppo and make maybe 300,000 refugees, we have to deal with the fact that he is pointing his machi machineries against civilian areas. So we could have done something about it. We could have said no fly zone over Aleppo or no fly zone over Derezor where there are now some American bases, which in fact is imposed. Now Americans had uh, in the east uh, bank of uh, the Euphrates, they don't allow the Russians or the regime to fly over that area. So we could have done something even not as recent as the Aleppo crisis, even before, since 2013, I said that we should at least threat Bashar al-Assad that if you keep fighting this ruthless war, we had to stop you. We can maybe uh, destroy some of your air bases when, by which then you wouldn't be able to do anything out of it. We could have done that, but the attitude that at that time was we had already uh, shot ourselves in the foot by entering Iraq, we will not do anything with Syria. That was the position in 2013. And I was like, but if you don't do anything, you will have more radicalized people in Syria, and then more radicals will enter Syria. And also the regime will be more uh, emboldened to do more damage to the uh, population in Syria. And everyone was like, no war, no, we will not intervene. But then in 2014, the US led a coalition to intervene in the war, but it was only because they had ISIS there. Well, a lot of Syrians argue that the casualties caused by the regime are more than the casualties uh, caused by ISIS. The refugees fleeing because of the regime airstrikes are more than those who are fleeing from ISIS. My family lived under ISIS, none of them was displaced. But when the regime started with the Russians attacking haphazardly, the areas, then everyone should leave. But with ISIS, yes, ISIS has this uh, uh, repressive apparatus that it will target those who are opposing their ideology or opposing the mechanisms of ruling the population. But otherwise, they will leave everyone alone. You don't have to uh, agree with them. You, have to, you can live your own life. With the regime, you cannot even stay in Aleppo or even now in eastern or western Ghouta. You have to flee because the regime is using the Russian mechanism of uh, these are flies, the better way to deal with them, uh, just dry the swamps. And then nobody will be there, and then we will announce that it's a liberated area, it's now back to the regime's uh, leadership. And that's very problematic. That, that's my position. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do anything about refugees 
when they become uh, refugees. But I'm saying we can do something before they have this identity as refugees. They come from areas, they were living, they were going to school, they were working. We should keep that life uh, intact, not allowing any dictator just to uh, displace them and dehouse them. Probably, but... Sure. Sure. I heard this story, exact story, before the U.S. intervened in Syria. They said, we will not intervene. We had tried it in Iraq. We have nothing to do with Syria. But then they, when they, when they wanted, they could. So... Um, just a quick point. There's not a necessarily there's not necessarily a disagreement between the two of you in that, in that I think what you're saying is you need to address the conditions that provoke refugee flight. What you're saying is okay, but if you don't address them, you can't force people to stay. And I don't know no, that you you wouldn't disagree with that. Yeah, people should flee. Yeah. The more challenging question is, you know, what what President Trump said is that people need to be protected near in or near where they are. And the radical critique of re the refugee regime is that it's a containment approach, right? Because you keep all these people in Turkey, you keep all these people in Jordan, don't let them come to Europe, don't let them come to... So that's the radical critique. But you know what? For people who have to get this work done, there ain't, there's just not going to be millions of refugees resettled in the United States and in Europe. It's just, well, in Europe, you know, the, 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 it's, not, it's not going to happen. So the reality is that we have to find solutions, mm -hmm. you know, solutions for refugees in places like Jordan and, um, you know, and Turkey uh, and Uganda um, that are real because we live in the real world. We don't, and, and, but by the same token, my own view is that means we need a relatively robust third country resettlement program in the United States and in other developed in northern countries, but without the expectation that they're going to resettle tens of millions of refugees. It's just not going to happen. Um, back here. Hi, um, my name is Meher. I'm an international studies student and art history here. And I wrote out my question because I'm not so eloquent. <laughs> it's, uh, there's a consensus among critics of the humanitarian system uh, stating that the perception of refugees in terms of biosecurity is damaging to these refugees and IDPs themselves as a uh, pertinent policy is then defensive rather than progressive. Uh, in what ways do you think that biosecurity and the concern for such is like manifested in immigration policy and what are your opinions on this? You wanna take this one? Sure, I'm happy to. Did you say a security bias? Uh, bias security, but the concern for security. Oh, bi security, yeah, essentially security, securitization of refugees. Look, that's true. That's what that's what people humanitarians really have to, I think, you know, uh, work against, um, without ignoring uh, legitimate concerns about security. So, I mean, I think the answer is yes, and you have to push back on it. I think actually, the more, in some respects, the more compelling question to me is, you know, um, is is a second bias that humanitarians have, which is, you know, we go to the global south if we provide uh, refugees with a modicum of assistance, we've done our job. Right, and that's, I think that's, you know, it's sort of, it's, it's, it's dehumanizing and I think it's, it's trivializing the lives of, of people. I think the international refugee regime, if you will, is, is beginning to come to grips with that, with these new global compacts on refugees and migration, where there is talk about providing real solutions to refugees, even if a country like Uganda or Turkey isn't gonna provide these people with citizenship. Give them opportunities to work. Give them opportunities to, 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 to be educated, to build human capital. And there's an increasing realization that that's really important. Whether it's gonna happen, you know, that's, that's the political challenge. Could I, could I toss this uh, to you with a, with a follow-up, uh, Chief? And that is, um, in the time that you've been with the Border Patrol, um, to what extent has the issue of, let me, let me call it just porous borders, or of the, the problem of, the borders being uh, unprotected. Uh, to what extent has that shifted from a kind of an economic concern uh, 
to a security concern? And if it has, how has that affected the way you all have to deal with this in a practical way? I think the, the post-9-11 environment is, was, was monumental as it related to how the society looked at immigration policy, law, and, and what it meant to U.S. borders. That, that, was the, that was the biggest change in my career uh, up until now. Now, I mean, there's a national debate about how we're going to continue and, and add capability. Uh, but 9-11 changed it from, I, I often tell people this, you know, in 1985, when I came into the Border Patrol, nobody really cared. If you lived in a border community, you cared about the Border Patrol. You realized how effective they could be on the, you know, in physical security for places like El Paso and Laredo, where I was. So the, the towns, the people who lived there understood the import of a secure border, but no one else did. Uh, in 1985, we cared. The team I worked on cared. Our, you know, my colleagues, we cared about each other. We cared about doing good things. But most of the society, like my, my parents uh, back home and. San Diego or, or uh, the, my cousins and aunts and uncles in Chicago, they, it was, they only knew about the border in Laredo, places like Laredo because I was there, not because it you know, ran across their headlines each and every day. But after 9-11, that changed everything. Yeah. I mean, I remember being, when I was, uh, I was in our Texas Bureau back in the early 80s, and, and uh, as I said at the beginning, spent some time on the border just kind of looking at the issue. Um, and recall one morning I was down on the border in El Paso literally watching the morning commute of men carrying domestic workers, women, across the border to go to work in El Paso for the day, and then they would go back home. Um, it was it was it was an illegal passage that was, you know, the Border Patrol kind of turned a blind eye to it for all the obvious reasons at that time. Um, so I'm down there walking along, and and uh, suddenly, you know, one of your little SUVs pulls up next to me, and one of your <laughs> uh, future colleagues said to me. What are you doing here? And I'm like, well, wait a minute. What, you're asking me what I'm doing here? I mean, I'm, I'm an American. I'm on the American side of the border. And he said, you ought to just get out of here. You know, go your separate way. So, um, but it was, it was, I think it was a different time then. And the, and the, and the way the Border Patrol had to respond to those things, um, there was a sort of, I mean, I, I, you wouldn't necessarily agree with it, but there was a flexibility about it. Um, and people could assess, you know, the danger, the threat, the concern, and, and, and enforce the policy, and yet, um, you, know, you know, recognize why there was the kind of migration that was coming across, particularly for those kinds of things. So, one more question. Um, yes, sir. I just have a practical question for the Chief. Can you wait for the mic? Just a practical question, and forgive my ignorance, but in terms of the border crossings, is there a distinction made for the undocumented persons in terms of refugee as opposed to migrant status? And what are the repercussions of that distinction? So in context, refugees come to, this, to the country with permission of the government. They've been vetted overseas. They come and we welcome them. When people are uh, encountered crossing irregularly, illegally across the border, um, they're treated uh, under the law um, as an illegal immigrant, and there's certain aspects to that. Part of the role that CBP does is to try to identify whether they're also seeking asylum. And so there are policies and laws in place that, that allow them to pursue an asylum claim um, if they come illegally to, to the states. Correct. Um, let me just comment a little, because I, I, I think the, the chief has it, has it essentially uh, um, it's, it's correct, but I, just so people understand, anyone who has a well-founded fear of persecution um, is a, and is outside their country of origin is a refugee, by definition. You don't have to, you know, you are a refugee. But in our law, we have two uh, uh, we have categories of refugees. We have people who we call refugees who come in through a, a process, a, an ordered process, where the United States identifies people who are in, a, in, in countries of refuge, and we bring them to the United States as, as refugees. That's the, that's, that's the system. That's our refugee resettlement system. The 1980 Act put that into effect. And then there are refugees who come to the United States through irregular means. And, they're, they're, and we call them asylum seekers, because they are. They, they appear at the border or they get into the country and they, they make a request for asylum. And if that asylum is granted, then they are 
you know, asylees, but in, under international law, they're both refugees. So that was the, those were the two systems that, that, uh, that, 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 that the chief was referring to. On that note, we are out of time. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions, uh, but lunch awaits, I guess. Um, so thank you to the panel and thank you to all of you. Thank you.